Hello, hello, it is I, Arudai, and welcome to another Savage Pathfinder video. And once again, we are on combat, but this should be the last combat video in the series. Uh, so we're going to go over the last of those situational rules so that you can know everything you need to know about combat and all the various things that can happen to you. But before we go into all of that, allow me to show you how you can show us your support. Please consider supporting us on our mission to bring guilt-free gaming to the tabletop community by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and possibly even becoming a channel member for access to exclusive videos, Geeks and Gamers tabletop emojis, and more. If you found this video particularly helpful, please consider leaving us a tip using the Super Thanks feature located next to the like buttons at the bottom of the video. Alright, here we go. I've got my handy dandy, uh... Pathfinder for Savage Worlds Core Rule Book, and uh, we are going back to page 138. Uh, where last time we left off with rest, we are going to be picking up with size and scale. Now, size and scale can get a little crazy and a little fun. Uh, even sounds a little complicated, but it really isn't once you understand the rules. Um, now, there's going to be a chart somewhere here around my head here very shortly. Uh, it's going to have a list of all the sizes and scales, so you can take a look at that and see what I'm talking about. But uh, every character, every creature, has a scale ranging from negative uh, 4 up to 20. Um, and certain ranges of those fall into a category of either tiny, small, um, normal, large, huge, or gargantuan. And all of those things come with different bonuses and different effects, and we're going to talk about all of them. Um, so the first thing to know is that uh, there are seven different scales, tiny to gargantuan, and in those is a range of those numbers I already listed, negative four up to 20. Um, those have a modifier on them, a scale modifier. So for example, um, there's a negative six for tiny, there's a plus six for gargantuan, and in between you've got minus four, plus four, minus two, plus two, and then none for just a normal sized, uh, like a regular person, like a human. Um, what this is, is when two different creatures of two different sizes attack each other, these modifiers come into play. Um, so when a smaller creature attacks a bigger creature, they get to add the difference in scale. Uh, so for example, if a uh, tiny f creature, like a fairy, okay, um, that would be somebody who's a negative six modifier, uh, were to attack a, let's pick a, a huge creature, something like a dragon. So we got a fairy attacking a dragon. Well, a fairy is minus six, a dragon is plus four, the difference in number scale there is ten, so the fairy would get a plus ten to attacking a dragon, because it's just really huge, and uh, there's <laughs> almost no odds of this tiny creature not being able to hit this massive, basically, barn that's in front of it. Um... If you do it the opposite, if the dragon tries to hit the fairy, well, then you do the opposite. You take minus 10. Uh, so, yeah, there's a tiny little gnat. Kind of harder for a dragon to hit that, uh, so it's going to be a minus 10 to the roll. And that's how you do the entire chart. Um, so if, if you if you go to whatever the range is, whatever that difference is, is either a plus or a minus, depending on if you're the smaller or larger target. Um, and those are two your your fighting rolls, uh, specifically. Uh, there are also some size modifiers that can come into play when you're using certain spells, and you'll want to look at those. Um, but there's also this table here, and it, it kind of tells you, hey, if you're this size, what are your general uh, damage scales and wound scales and things like that? Um, another important thing about the size of creatures um, is when you're doing called shots and what that means for target. Um, something, uh, and this, they're wise to kind of touch on this, something I notice players like to do is with bigger creatures, narratively, for whatever reason, they feel like they want to target vital organs uh, more often. Um, like, for example, when they're fighting a wolf, I don't get a lot of people who are like, I want to shoot that wolf right in the eye. That doesn't happen very often. But when it's a dragon, uh, that's something that gets brought up a lot. Um, so there is an important distinction here that when you're doing a called shot on something like that. You're not, so a called shot usually is normal. It's gonna be whatever's based on that chart, right? You're shooting for the creature's head, it's gonna be a minus four. You're shooting for their arm, it's gonna be minus two, whatever. But when you pick something specific, like an eyeball, uh, the called shot is now about that thing's size, not the creature. Um, 
So you want to use the scale of the eye, not the dragon's head, or, or the dragon as a whole, I should say. Um, whenever you're determining how you're going to be able to hit that. So a dragon's eye is probably like the size of a, I don't know. Um, that'd probably be like the size of a, what, basketball or something, or a dog, maybe. Uh, maybe even a, a small creature like a bobcat. Uh, in which case, then you would just use the minus two or the minus four. You wouldn't use the plus four that is normally the dragon. Um, so very important when you are considering that. Um, next thing we're going to talk about, being stunned. Um, I, I like stunned better in this system than certain other ones. Uh, I think it's got some interesting effects. Um, but there are certain abilities out there, um, like the stun power, the magic power, uh, that uh, can stun you. There's also various creatures and things like that, uh, traps even, uh, that can leave you in the stunned condition. Um, basically what happens is um, once you get stunned, a, a variety of different things occur to your character. The first one is you become distracted. Uh, you also become vulnerable. Um, you fall prone. Uh, that can either be like straight up prone, like falling flat on the ground, uh, or if you're able to argue it out with your DM, you could even say, like, to your knees, but in some fashion, you are prone, and um, you have the actual status applied to you. Uh, you can't move or take any actions, um, and if you're near allies and enemies, you don't get added into a gang-up bonus because you're stunned. Important notes about the distracted and the vulnerable. The distracted comes off at the end of your next turn like normal, no matter what, so... As you know, distracted and vulnerable usually comes off at the end of your next turn. That is still true of distracted. Vulnerable, however, remains until you are able to become unstunned. Because uh, you do have to keep trying to not be stunned. Um, so you will remain vulnerable so long as you are stunned. It doesn't come off as it normally would. Uh, how do you get out of this? Well, you got to use the recovery, which is at the start of a stunned character's turn, you make a vigor roll as a free action. Success means you're no longer stunned, but you remain vulnerable until the end of your next turn. With a raise, the vulnerable state goes away at the end of this turn. Uh, so, uh, at the start of your turn, if you pass, um, then at that point, whenever you first pass is when the vulnerable will come off the next turn. If you happen to get a raise, it'll come off that turn immediately, which, or at the end of that turn, um, immediately, which is nice. Uh, how about support? Support is something you can do uh, during combat. Uh, sometimes you want to help other people do great things, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, sometimes you want to help you uh, do great things. Or if you're like my characters, you're prone to being a screw-up, and they want to make sure you don't fail. Um, so the way this works is you declare on your turn, hey, I want to support whoever. Um, I want to support a rude eye. Um, and you make your skill roll, or your trait roll, uh, to support. If you get a success, you grant that person a plus one bonus, uh, to them doing whatever it is they're doing. If you get a raise, you give them a plus two. Uh, multiple people can support one person, so four different people could give, uh, plus one to a character, and that would be perfectly fine. Um, or, you know, three people could do plus two, plus one, plus one, but no matter what the maximum is for, you can't give people more than plus four through support. Um, so that's fine, and, um, once that person's turn is over, so when it gets to a rude eyes turn, and I do the thing that you supported me with, and I add my plus four, since you all decided to help me out, because you care about me so much, um, at the end of that turn, that bonus goes away. I don't get to keep it forever. It's just for whenever I try to do that thing they were supporting me doing. Um, so it could have been like, hey, they were trying to help me, uh, heal somebody, or they were trying to help me, um... Uh, shoot somebody, or whatever the case might be. Now, you can be creative with this. I mean, uh, the obvious way is, oh, hey, you're trying to heal somebody here. Let me also roll healing skill to help you. But if you want to be creative and you're, you uh, bring it up to the, the GM and your GM is like, that makes sense to me, you can use your strengths to aid them as well. So, for example, if I was doing a healing roll and you're not good at healing, but maybe you are a um, herbalist or some sort of survival, a ranger or something... Um, so you might say, hey, can I roll a survival roll to look around for uh, some quick healing healing herbs that would be useful in his attempt to try to heal this person? Um, and if that is a reasonable suggestion to your GM, then you could take your stronger roll, which is the survival, and use that to try to assist me in my healing. Uh, so you can get creative. Um, you're not always going to be told yes, but uh, 
sometimes it, it doesn't hurt to ask because those things can make a big difference if you're rolling like a d10 versus like a d4 uh you know what i'm saying so you can also do things like uh use general encouragement uh so example you could say hey i want to use my persuasion role uh to try to motivate him to get this shot and just say hey man you can do it um and uh that can also be allowed by your gm uh, but usually, uh, that's one of the, there's some situations in Savage Worlds Pathfinder that fall under the, um, uh, repeating rule, um, where, where things kind of lose their effectiveness over time, the more you repeat them. Uh, so if you're just telling them, Hey, good job, man, every round that might not work the next time around, because there's only so many times good job is going to encourage them enough to do what they're doing. And that is support. And then there's surprise. Yes, there is a surprise in Savage Pathfinder. This actually very recently just came up on one of our shows. So let's go over it. It's uh, very interesting um, to understand. So combat sometimes starts before everyone involved is ready. Uh, usually this should is probably some sort of ambush, some sort of trap, or some creature was hunting you and you didn't realize it. Um, whatever the situation might be. So the way it works is let's say there was somebody waiting in ambush for you. They knew you were coming, or they were on alert, and they figured that there was a good chance people were going to, you know, walk into whatever they were doing. Um, ambushers are considered on hold uh, by default. So the, the people who are surprising you um, immediately go on hold. So we'll say there's four bandits uh, that were trying to ambush you in an alley. They all go on hold. They are now in the hold status. You, the ambushee, get a chance to notice that they are going to ambush you. Uh, and you make a notice roll. Uh, when you make that notice roll, if you succeed, you get an action card. Meaning you still get to act in the surprise round. Um, you just can't be first. Because the people on hold will always be first. Um, even, I believe if they have a joker, I'd have to double check on that. But uh, let me see here. Um, for, for ambushing specifically, it looks like a joker would trump being on hold. So uh, you do deal cards to the people on hold who are ambushing in case they get a joker uh, because a joker would allow them to trump being on hold uh, in this particular case. All right, so if you pass, uh, you get to act in that round. If you fail, you don't get to act in the surprise round. So there are three categories of people. The people who are doing the ambushing. Uh, so if you are doing the ambushing, you're on hold, uh, which means you're going to get to act before everyone else, period. If you are the ones being ambushed, you get a chance to notice. If you succeed on your notice, you get dealt an action card and you get to act in the turn as normal, going after all of those guys ambushing you who are on hold. Um, and the people who fail don't get to act on that turn at all. You are just completely caught off guard. You are totally surprised. That's bad news for you. Uh, so now we're going to talk about tests. Tests, yes. Tests are a lot of fun and a, and a cool way to assist and do things in combat or set yourself up. There's a lot of reasons you might do a test. But the idea behind a test um, is you are using a skill against a foe who is going to oppose you with a different skill uh, in an effort to throw them off their game. And you can test with technically any ability. There are some that make more sense than others, but technically you could test anybody with any ability out there if you have a creative enough reason. The most obvious ones are going to be things like taunting somebody or um, using, uh, your athletics to faint, uh, that sort of thing to kind of like psych them out, like, hey, I'm gonna go left, but I really go right, that sort of stuff. Whatever skill you choose, you're gonna roll against your opponent. So let's just say, for example, I did take, um, athletics. Uh, so athletics, I say, hey, I'm going to test my foe, and I'm going to make a feint with my athletics check to psych them out, make them think I'm going left, I'm really going right, I roll it. Once you've rolled your athletics, that number is going to set the target number for your opponent. Um, so you want to resolve yours first. Uh, this is very important. So when you roll your athletics, um, let's say you get a six, that is the number your opponent's going to have to meet or beat. Uh, so once you say, hey, I'm happy with that number, you can't change it anymore. So if you want it to go higher, you need a Benny right then. So if you want to make the target number higher, you're going to have to use your Benny then. Uh, once they roll, you can't bend you anymore. Um, so you set that number, and then they're going to oppose with whatever the... Um, in most cases, they're going to oppose with whatever the um, linked attribute is for that skill. So if you're doing fighting, and... I'm uh, sorry, you're doing uh, athletics, and the linked skill is agility, they are going to oppose you with an agility roll. So they're going to make an agility roll, 
And if their agility roll meets or beats the roll you made, then you failed on your test. You didn't successfully faint them, you didn't successfully taunt them, or whatever it is. Um, but if they fail, if they don't meet the number that you set up, then you get to pick. Do they become distracted or vulnerable? Um, if you win with a raise, uh, the target is also shaken. So you can, uh, in addition, also make them shaken uh, on top of those things if you have that big of a gap uh, between them. So if you have a gap of four plus another four, so a gap of eight essentially, uh, at that point you have also shaken them. That is how badly you beat them in that test. Um, the GM can also apply things in such as, uh, I don't know, if you did like a trip attack, maybe they fall prone, something like that. The reason this can be useful, obviously you can set yourself up to make an attack against your foe easier. It could be also to help your allies out. Um, if you're something like a rogue, uh, it might be setting yourself up for sneak attack. Or if you're an ally and you did two actions and you felled your foe faster than you thought you would and you got that extra action, you could set your fellow rogue up. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons you could do a test because, you know, rogues only get sneak attack on vulnerable foes. So you could be like, okay, I killed this guy. I haven't, I said I was going to do two actions. I still got one to blow. Um, hey, you, your shoes are untied. To make the guy look down, vulnerable, uh, the rogue gets a sneak attack. So there's a lot of reasons you might do a test. Sometimes there could be modifiers. So if, you, if you're doing a shooting test, like maybe you're trying to do like suppression fire, for example, is what you're going for. Like that, that's what you might use shooting as a test for. Um, if there's cover involved... Um, at that point, there could be modifiers to your test. Um, so there's other things that could come into play, um, and that's usually your GM's call. Uh, repetition. Um, again, this is the repetition rule I was talking about earlier. If uh, you try something more than once, it's going to be at least effective or might not even work at all. Uh, so if you try to tell the same guy that his shoes on is untied two turns in a row, well, okay, your, your GM might say, hold on, bud. Uh, so the first row, you're like, hey, your shoes are untied. And the guy looks and, well, my shoes aren't untied. Um, and then the second round, you're like, no, really, really, you missed it. Your shoes are definitely untied. Look again. Um, probably not going to work, but your GM could say, all right, this is the second time you've done that. I'm going to give you a minus two on it, but you can try it again. So you can try to faint him with that minus two. Um, and if the dummy falls for it the second time, well, that's him being an idiot. And then the third time, your GM might be like, all right, no, he's not falling for that a third time. Uh, you got to pick something else or it just fails. Um, so that is what the repetition rule is in regards to tests. You can also argue for additional dice with your GM uh, if you have some sort of mechanical reason that makes sense. Uh, be prepared to be told no, but it's possible. So, for example, if you're doing a shooting roll, okay, that suppression fire that I was talking about earlier, trying to pin down your foes to make them vulnerable for your friends, um... You might say, hey, my weapon has a rate of fire too, which means technically I would normally get two attacks, um, in which case your GM might say, okay, you get two test rolls, keep the higher of the two. Uh, so there are situations where you could get more than one test die to try to set that number against your foe. Um, so be creative. Think about the ways that your abilities would normally give you multiple things. Are you a frenzy fighter? Do you have rate of fire of two? Things like that. And if it makes sense and uh, your GM's cool that he might give you that extra dice to, to give you a little bit of an advantage uh, in that situation. Touch attacks. Sometimes you just want to touch someone. Um, a touch attack where your only intention is to touch your foe. You're not really trying to deal any like significant damage or something like that. Uh, you can give a plus two. It's not hard, or at least it's easier to just casually tag somebody than it is to land a significant blow that has a real impact. Uh, there might be all sorts of reasons you would need to just touch somebody. Maybe you got to deliver some sort of touch effect. Um, maybe uh, you coated your hands with some sort of poison that only works on contact. Whatever. Uh, something like that. Uh, a touch attack would be just the same as if you were trying to grapple or hit them. The only difference is you're getting a plus two because it's not as hard to do it. I did promise you in the last video that we were going to talk about fighting with two weapons. And here we are. We're going to do it. Um, so a character armed with two we melee weapons adds plus one to your fighting roll if your foe has a single one or is unarmed and has no shield. Um, so if you have two weapons and your opponent doesn't have a shield, um, only has one weapon or is unarmed uh, and has no shield, uh, then in those cases you get plus one against them with your fighting roll. Uh, it's assumed that you have an advantage over them because you got two weapons and they're, they're trying to parry off attacks from like two sides. 
Um, this does not apply against a creature who has natural weapons. So if uh, you're doing this against a creature that uh, has teeth or claws or horns or something like that that they could naturally defend themselves with, uh, then in that case, your two-weapon fighting does not come into play. Um, if you're wielding two small ranged weapons, there's no advantage. So having two hand crossbows, even though it's technically two weapons, does not give you any sort of distinct advantage. Um, and there's even an edge out there called two-weapon fighting that can actually make using two weapons even more effective for you. Um, so those are all of the perks of fighting with two weapons. Um, we just mentioned it, Unarmed Defender. What is that? Well, let me tell you about it. If uh, you don't have weapons, you are considered unarmed. Uh, if you don't have natural weapons, even more so, you are unarmed. Um, it is difficult, if you're unarmed, to defend yourself against somebody who is. Uh, they definitely have the upper hand if they're wielding a sword at you and all you have is your hands. Uh, so an attacker who is armed with a melee weapon against somebody who is considered an unarmed combatant or defender... Um, gets plus two to their fighting attack. Um, so if I'm attacking you and you have no weapons, I get plus two to my rolls to try to hit you. Um, now, if you have the drop, those two things don't stack. You don't get the drop plus the unarmed defender bonus. You get one or the other. Uh, you should take the drop. <laughs> um, but if you don't have the drop and they're unarmed, this plus two is very nice. Uh, it, important to note, it's only to the roll to attack itself, not to the damage whereas the drop gives you both, um, plus four to the attack and to, and to the damage. Uh, but for this, you only get the plus two to your fighting skill uh, to try to hit them. What if you're on an unstable platform? A character attempting to fire or throw a ranged weapon from the back of a horse or other mount, moving vehicle, or an unstable platform. Um, I don't know, maybe you're, uh, you're doing a like a less and you're going down a set of stairs on the back of a shield. You subtract two from your throwing or shooting rolls. Um, so you'd get a minus two for being on a platform that's not stable. Vehicles. Vehicles function very similarly uh, to what you see in combat already, but there's a whole section on vehicles and um, I'll probably just do a video on those all by themselves. At some Wild attack. Well, sometimes you are desperate and you're gonna throw caution to the wind and you're gonna swing wildly, swing for the stars. Uh, with everything that you've got, just putting your, your full weight behind this attack. Um, that is a wild attack in Savage Pathfinder. A wild attack adds plus two to your fighting or athletics attacks uh, for throwing, um, and the resulting damage for the turn. So you get the plus two both to the attack roll uh, to hit, as well as the damage itself. Um... But because you were so reckless in your, your attempt to try to hit this person and you just kind of uh, let go of all skill and finesse, you just wanted to get the power behind that, uh, that blow, you are vulnerable afterwards until the end of your next turn. So you kind of leave yourself open to other attacks a little bit. Um, you can do it with multi-attacks. Um, so, and in, in that won't, it doesn't do anything. Once you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable. So... If you want a wild attack on your next three strikes and just go crazy, uh, you might as well. You, you already took the vulnerable penalty and you can't stack vulnerable. Um, but you can't combine this with desperate attack. They are two very distinct things. Your attack is either desperate or it's wild. You pick one and stick with it. And then the last thing, withdrawing from melee. Um, so when you withdraw from melee... Uh, all adjacent foes who are not shaken, okay, um, or not stunned, uh, they get to make a free attack against you, okay? It's very important to understand this is not like other systems like 5e. Um, your opponent is not limited to doing this once. Just because you saw them take a free attack against somebody else who moved away doesn't mean they're not going to get to do it against you if you try to move away. This isn't a one reaction kind of thing. If you move away from them and they're not shaken or not stunned, they do get to take a free attack against you. Um, there are ways uh, to, to circumnavigate that, uh, like having, for example, the extraction edge or the improved extraction edge. Uh, but generally speaking, if you withdraw from melee and uh, you didn't shake your foes first or stun them, they're going to get to try to hit you. Uh, so something to consider tactically for sure. And that's a wrap. We have finished combat, boys and girls. 
Uh, that is the entire combat section with all of the situational rules. You now know all of the little tiny things that can make a big difference on the battlefield in the Savage Pathfinder universe. Uh, so what did you think? Was there anything that really struck you as interesting? Something that uh, you're going to try in your next game? Uh, or something that blows your mind and you're worried about your GM using against you? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm not sure exactly what my next series is going to be. I am planning that out, but uh, I hope you enjoyed this one and that it educated you and will assist you in playing this game. Uh, I think it's a wonderful system and that um, there's lots of little nuances in there that really set it apart from the other systems out there. Um, also, we would love to see you in Gilded. Come check it out. Uh, you can come talk to myself, Sevi, the Tabletop crew. Uh, there's all sorts of other like-minded individuals just like you who believe in guilt-free gaming, who just want to talk D&D or Savage Pathfinder or Pathfinder or even card games like Magic the Gathering or even Tabletop board games. All of that stuff is there. Uh, and we even have non-game sections, too, if uh, you want to break from the nerd them and just want to talk about movies or working out, whatever uh, is on your mind. Uh, it's a lot of fun in there, and hey, it's all free. You can even find a table to play at. Uh, there are people looking for games all the time. Um, so the link is in the description of the video below, and uh, we would love you to click on it and come say hello. Uh, other than that, uh, may all your games be guilt-free and fun, and I will talk to you Later. Mm -hmm.